morning, everybody. No, hello, everybody. I recognize that it's not the morning anymore. Um, my name is Serene Haydar. I am the clinical pharmacy, um, one of the clinical pharmacists at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, and I lead the implementation along with my um, team members for the implementation of pharmacogenomics at our institution. What we're going to talk about today is about the clinical, just clinical pearls for implementing a pharmacogenomics if you're interested or are about to start or have recently started implementing pharmacogenomics, what are things that you should keep in mind or things that we have learned along the years that could may help you as you're going through your implementation story. So throughout the next hour, what I'm going to talk about is really, uh, I'm going to discuss three stories. Um, the first one is going to be how to report incidental findings and um, have a process for discussing familial implications of pharmacogenes and pharmacogenomic testing. Um, second story we'll talk about is how to update pharmacogenomic test results and considerations for that. And finally, we'll end with um, adapting and migrating to a new electronic health record, which is something we had to deal with at St. Jude um, over the past year and a half. So just quickly before we get started, I just wanted to give you a landscape of what St. Jude's pharmacogenomic program is. Uh, the protocol that we currently genotype patients or the majority of our patients on a protocol um, called PT for Kids. The goal of this research protocol is to migrate pharmacogenomic tests from the laboratory into routine patient care for the results to be available preemptively into the medical record, as well as uh, for clinicians to utilize this information routinely as they are thinking about pharmacotherapy in our patients. Uh, we elected to sorry to interrupt. Start. Your uh, video is off. Oh, my video is off. Okay. Can you see me better? Can you see me? Yes. Now? Uh, so we elected to return uh, and genotype patients on a protocol instead of clinical care because we started this program about 13 years ago, and we wanted oversight from the IRB for incidental genomic findings that could have occurred as well as um, oversight from the IRB to have a process because we are, we were, and currently are also withholding results uh, for pharmacogenomic tests that are on our array until they, they become clinically actionable. So our process is as follows. Um, patients who are eligible for genotyping are approached by a group of trained research nurses who approach the patients and discuss pharmacogenomic testing with them. Patients are, ha there's a consent discussion that occurs with the patients and their parents if they're minors, uh, after which genomic DNA is obtained from a blood sample. The patients are then genotyped um, on an array um, of Pharmacoscan array by Thermo Fisher. We receive about 1,200 genotype, uh, gene um, test results on this um, on this array. The majority of the genes remain in a research database and are migrated into the electronic medical record when they are available, when they are clinically actionable, um, and then migrated into the EHR where they are available for clinical use available for clinical decision support, and at that point, we return results to prescribers and provide patient education about the results. We currently return results for 15 pharmacogenes. Um, we did not release every, we did not return all these gene test results at once. We started with two genes in 2011, which are the two genes where we were the most comfortable with, and then added on over time and availability of CPIC guideline and as the um, evidence for pharmaco for relationship between a pharmacogene and a drug um, became strong in the medical literature. So we are at 15 genes that are implemented. We currently we have implement linked 74 drugs to these genes over time, and we'll talk about them. We've had to update pharmacogenomic information, so we've genotype we've linked 74 genes to 50, 74 medications to 15 genes, but over the over the years have had to unimplement certain medications, and these are the ones that are in red that are crossed off uh, with the year that they were um, D or unimplemented at our institution. So the first story we're going to talk about today is how to deal with familial implications of pharmaco after pharmacogenomic testing. And so just um, to kind of understand um, where familial implications comes, um, these are the genes, uh, these are the most common pharmacogenes that um, are available currently in clinical practice. Uh, the first one that I'm going to talk about related to familiar implications about pharmacogenomic testing is related to G6PD because G6PD is located on the X chromosome, and this allows us or causes us 
um, to be able to identify or have suggestive findings of sex chromosome abnormalities. So the only gene that is currently, the only pharmacogene that is on the X chromosome is G6PD. So just a quick overview about what G6PD is. Uh, G6PD deficiency is an X-linked disorder that manifests as um, patients developing hemolytic anemia most of the time when they have a triggering agent uh, or exposed to certain uh, stressed foods or medications that, cause, uh, that can cause hemolytic anemia. It is the most common genetic disorder um, worldwide, about 400 people, 400 million people globally are thought um, and estimated to be G6PD deficient. It is most commonly seen in Africa, Southeast Asia, the Mediterranean area, and the Middle East. So, why are we talking about G6PD deficiency as a pharmacogene? So, as I mentioned, G6PD is located on the X chromosome, so males will have one copy of this gene. So, it's easy to assign a phenotype for these patients. Uh, males will have a single allele, and one allele will determine the genotype that the phenotype that the patient has. Females have two alleles, which means that um, we will um, that that the relation the both X chromosomes are important in determining uh, genotype for patients uh, for female patients. And then um, when we find when we have a patient who reports as a female and we know has two X chromosomes. It is um, expected that we will have two alleles for the G6PD gene. And then what usually happens is that, uh, not usually, what can sometimes happen is when we have male patients who are phenotypic males and we have two X chromosomes reported on them, which means that these patients have, are supposed to have one X chromosome, they have two, and then the question is what do we do with that suggestive finding that the patient may have an extra X chromosome after confirming, obviously, that um, the results are the results from the lab are actually um, correct and there was not a sample mix-up. So what does it mean for a male patient to have two X chromosomes? This is a uh, syndrome known as Klinefelter syndrome. So 47 um, XXY is one of the manifestations of Klinefelter syndrome. It is a chromosomal condition that affects um, males. Uh, physical and cognitive de development. Males tend to not, these patients tend not to produce enough testosterone. They have delayed puberty. They have breast enlargements. Um, infertility is also a hallmark of Klinefelter syndrome. Uh, children who usually um, are younger tend to have learning disability, delayed speech, um, delayed language development, and compared to um, individuals who have an XY karyotype, Patients who have Klinefelter syndrome are at increased risk of female-related disorders such as breast cancer, systemic lupus, and osteoporosis, and throughout their lifetime will have to be monitored for these conditions, um, which is something that you also would um, evaluate in a male patient, but probably less because of the lower incidence, it is not something that people will tend to think about. So we consider um, and the medical community considers Klinefelter syndrome as an incidental finding when you're genotyping patients for, uh, for G6PD and you notice and you, you find an extra X chromosome. But what is really an incidental finding? Um, by definition, an incidental finding is a result um, that is not related to the indication why the test is being ordered. But um, nonetheless, it may have medical value or utility to the clinical team and to the patients. Incidental findings are commonly referred to have different names. Um, the most the most common uh, terminology that you will see would tend to be either secondary findings or an unanticipated finding or an unexpected positive finding. Um, incidental findings in pharmacogenomics um, are more likely to be discovered when panel pharmacogenomic testing is ordered as opposed to single gene, because when you're going to do a single gene test, it is easy to explain to the patients. Um, what are the possibilities of us finding certain um, results that we may not have expected? When you do a panel test, there's a lot more genes that are going to be reported, um, and this tends to be the context in which patients are discovered to have Klinefelter, Klinefelter syndrome. So what has been, our experience at St. Jude has been uh, with sex chromosomal abnormalities. Uh, we have genotyped about six, a little bit more than 6,000 patients um, on our pg for kids protocol. We have had four phenotypic male patients who have been, uh, have had a suggestive finding of two X chromosomes. 
Um, they had a 47 XXY karyotype. All patients were younger than 18 years of age. We discussed um, with their parents the possibility that the patients may have Kleinfelter syndrome, um, gave them the option of confirmatory testing, and all four patients have been confirmed as having um, uh, Kleinfelter syndrome. And we have one phenotypic female patient with one X chromosome and one Y chromosome um, who was diagnosed, uh, who um, also had uh, Swire syndrome. So, if you are going to consider genotyping your patients to determine uh, G6PD phenotype or their G6PD status, uh, this tends to be our recommended steps of actions for, um, for managing patients who may have either Kleinfelter syndrome or any of the other sex chromosome-related abnormalities um, that may occur on, in our case, the X chromosome because of G6PD. So, uh, first step would be that if a patient has a suggestive finding for G6PD um, to inform our process is to inform the genetics team as well as the primary care teams of um, the G6PD genotype finding. Uh, pharmacogenomic testing at most institutions, including ours and most clinical laboratories, is a CLIA certified test for pharmacogenomic testing. It is not CLIA certified for karyotype testing, so there's a need for confirmatory testing um, to confirm that a patient may have Kleinfelter or confirm that the patient may have an extra or a missing X chromosome. So after the genetics team and the primary care team are informed of the, of the finding, um, we sit down and offer genetic counseling to the patients and their family members. If they do consent um, to um, a consultation with the genetic counselor, then the genetic team will counsel the patients on Kleinfelter syndrome, offer confirmatory testing, and when confirmatory test uh, confirmation of Kleinfelter syndrome is, um, is obtained, the patients are referred to a specialized team for follow-up care, such as with, an, with endocrinologists or follow-up for other um, age-appropriate um, follow-up tests for patients who may have Kleinfelter syndrome. So this is the first case that I wanted to discuss, patients who may have, in whom we may discover sex chromosomal abnormalities when we're genotyping for G6PD. The other case I wanted to discuss is the case of malignant hyperthermia and familial implications um, to pharmacogenomic testing. So let's take, um, discuss this as a case. Um, a six-year-old boy who undergoes uh, preemptive pharmacogenomic testing is found to have a high-risk variant in the RYR1 gene, and this high-risk variant predisposes the patient to developing malignant hyperthermia when they're exposed to triggering agents, and we'll get into that in a minute. Um, the patients and the three siblings have not had pharmacogenomic testing um, ever in their life. So, for those of you who um, may want a refresher on one, what malignant hyperthermia is. It is a potentially fatal disorder that occurs due to an acceleration of metabolism in skeletal muscles. It leads to um, a prolonged um, contraction of muscles, which tends to, which can cause muscle destruction, rhabdomyolysis, can lead to tetany, um, fevers, and patients can die um, because of it. It is um, a genetically inherited disorder in two genes um, that we know of at this time, RYR1 and CACNA1S. These two genes have an autosomal dominant um, pad pattern um, of, um, of inheritance. So people who have a high-risk um, genotype have inherited one high-risk allele are at risk of um, having that uh, susceptibility. And if a person has that one high-risk variant, it means that their parents, one of their parents, um, has passed this down to them, and meaning that one of these parents is also susceptible to developing malignant hyperthermia. So as we were thinking about how to return RYR1 and CACNA1S, there were some key considerations that we thought um, that we had to think about. So it's important if you are going to return these two pharmacogenes to have a process set up and approved at your institution before you start returning these results. Um, if a patient, um, should your institution offer genetic counseling for, farm, for the patient's family member? Because this is a gene that has an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. If you find a patient who has this high-risk, potentially fatal um, condition, uh, should you not, what is your responsibility? What is our responsibility as an institution? Should we return, um, should we offer uh, counseling to the family members and let them know um, that they are at, that they may be at risk. So, should we offer counseling? 
um, which family members should we offer counseling to? Should genotype testing of family members be offered at our institution, or should we just inform them that there's an option for genotype testing and who will perform that? Where will that be performed? Uh, where should the testing occur? And again, who is going to pay for the genotype test, for the testing, for the confirmatory testing in the family members? So, what we elected to do at St. Jude is that we will offer uh, genetic counseling and confirmatory testing at our institution. Um, we will offer cascade testing, which means um, testing of all the patient's uh, first degree relatives, so mom and dad and full, um, and full biological siblings. Um, and testing will occur at our, will, um, the testing cost will be assumed by our institution. So this patient that we had, um, the parents decided um, to undergo genomic, uh, to undergo gen pharmacogenomic testing and confirming pharmacogenomic testing to the whole family. Um, the patient had uh, two sisters, um, a brother, and obviously um, mom, and at the time mom and dad were available. So they all opted for genotyping, and it was found out that dad and one of the sisters was also a carrier of that high-risk RYR1 genetic mutation that the patient had, which meant that all three individuals are also genetically predisposed to developing malignant hyperthermia if they're exposed to triggering medications such as inhaled fluorinated anesthetics or suctional choline. So, um, after, the after we found out about the results, we counseled myself as well as the genetic counselor, sat down with the patient and um, discussed what it means for the patient as well as the family members to have this RYR1 genetic mutation and offer genetic counseling related to that. So again, what are our recommended steps or the steps that we have created uh, for managing pharmacogenomic test results that may have familiar implications? Once we receive the pharmacogenomic test result, if it has a familiar implication and it's a high-risk result, uh, the first step for us is to inform the primary care team and the genetic counselors of, the, of that high-risk pharmacogenomic test result. We return the result to the patient, offer genetic counseling to the patients, and ask them if they would like to, see, to speak to a genetic counselor to learn more about family inheritance patterns of this, um, of this high-risk result. And then if the patients agree to genetic counseling, um, genetic counseling is performed as well as confirmatory testing um, within our institution. So these are just two examples of familiar and incidental findings that are related to, um, to pharmacogenes. There are others that I wanted to quickly mention. Um, genes that have dominant expression patterns include MTRNR1, HLA, and NHLA, um, in addition to RYR1 and CACNA1S that we discussed, and then the gene that is linked with X-linked inheritance is, um, is G6PD. What are key takeaways to take out of this first story for familiar implications of pharmacogenomic testing? So just um, remember that most pharmacogenes have a co-dominance inheritance. They are not dominant genes, um, so there's no direct implication for family members. Some pharmacogenes, as, as we discussed and showed, have inheritance, have dominant inheritance patterns that have familiar implications, and it is important to have a process set up and approved by your institutional leadership and oversight committees before you start returning these results um, to patients. So moving on to story number two, how to update pharmacogenomic test results. So we have been genotyping patients for about 13 years, <clears throat> and as you can imagine, pharmacogenomic testing and not just the testing platforms, but information related to interpreting pharmacogenomic test results has changed over time. So um, we currently report pharmacogenomic um, test results in the lab sheets and the flow sheets um, and um, of, of our medical records. And we made the decision many years ago uh, when we started this process that patients, um, that clinicians may not necessarily understand what a um, let's say CYP2, B6, star, star 2, star 5 genotype is. So every single one of our results is um, coupled with an interpretive consult that is written by a pharmacist that is associated with each one of these results where, for example, you will explain what the phenotype assignment is for that patient as well as explain um, clinical implications of that test result. So um, also what we do is that whenever 
We return the results, place them in the medical record. In addition to the consult, we also add uh, phenotype-specific genomic indicators and problem list entries into the EHR as applicable and when it's applicable to add that information. So over time, we've had to create a process for updating pharmacogenomic test results. And um, <coughs> this test, these, um, this process is led at our institution by the pharmacogenomics program, and it includes information such as updating the patient's phenotype when applicable, updating the interpretive consult note that I just showed you. Um, we, um, once that interpretive consult note is updated in the medical record, it shows up in the EHR as a corrected result. Um, this is the only capability that you have in a medical record system to update the information that is already posted. And so the information that we update in the consult note includes the phenotype, the activity score, as well as the allele function as applicable to the update um, and uh, to the specific updates. Uh, we also update the genomic indicator if the phenotype of the patient has changed and also update or add the pharmacogenomic problem list when applicable, depending on the change in phenotypes. Clinicians and patients are notified of the update only if a phenotype change occur. If an activity score changes but the phenotype hasn't changed, we don't. We tend not to inform patients and the prescribers because it's going to confuse them um, a little bit more and it's not clinically actionable. So we have worked on um, updating uh, phenotype-specific results um, in the medical records for the clinicians, so in our um, in our EA, current EHR, but also made it a point that the patients also be able to see their updated results in their online portal, so they are also available in the portal, and when the results are updated, patients get the notification in the portal that says that their pharmacogenomic results have been updated. Uh, we decided that we will update any new res any results on any patient who is still who remains enrolled on our protocol and is alive. Um, irrespective of when the original test result was generated. This was, uh, we had a lot of discussions about this through um, discussing what is our responsibility? Should we update the results from 10 years ago? Maybe the patients are not looking at their portal. They don't even know that they still have a St. Jude portal. What should be done with, um, with, with all the results? Um, and we, made, we decided that we will update results independent of when they were, when they were generated at the institution. So we published on this in about four years ago. In June 2019, um, most of the results that we had updated were related to CYP2C19 and a phenotype change in CYP2C19. For the ones of you who were in practice then, if you remember, there was no CYP2C19 rapid metabolizer phenotype. There was only a CYP2C19 ultra-rapid metabolizer phenotype. And so about 3% of all of our results had to be updated to assign the new CYP2C19 rapid metabolizer phenotype in, this, in the patient category. And again, we went through all the updates and updated the consults, the genomic indicator, the problem list, as well as um, notified clinicians and patients about this update. So flash forward five years, four years now, and we are again uh, dealing with an update to the CYP2D, to CYP2D6, so not CYP2C19 this time, but a new update. In November of 2022, there was an update to the ideal functionality of some CYP2D6 variants that are listed on the slide. Um, the platform that we currently use, which is the PharmacoScan platform by Thermo Fisher, interrogates two of these alleles, STAR9 and STAR41. And a major up and this update led to a downgrade of activity score for CYP2D6 STAR9 and CYP2D6 STAR41, where the activity score was downgrade downgraded from 0.5 to 0.25. Nearly 16% of the patients that we genotyped for CYP2D6 would have had an activity score update based on this um, STAR9 and STAR41 uh, star change in, um, uh, in allele functional assignment. And so this is where you can see uh, where you can see it on our patients. Uh, we would have updated, we did, uh, we uh, will have a process to update these consults. And uh, the wording and the activity score that is mentioned in the consult for the 1,000 plus patients who are affected. However, the good news is this does not result in a phenotype change for 1,000 patients. It actually only resulted in a phenotype change for three patients out of the 1,030 patients who would have had, who, um, had the, star four, the star 9 and star 41 in yield. So it's not a huge um, 
change in a huge number of change in phenotypes, it is mostly a downgrading um, of activity score that does not change phenotype. And so it's not very, um, at this time, uh, clinically burdensome for clinicians as well as patients because um, they're not going to have a phenotype change. The question I get routinely asked about is, well, how do you know that the patient's genotype, uh, how do you know that there are updates that are available? How do you know that STAR-9 and STAR-41 were downgraded? And so there's two places for you to go if you want to do this. Um, the first place is if you go to the CPIC website um, on the bottom right of the screen, uh, click on Contact, which is at the, which will be um, as as one of your tabs, and you'll go you'll be directed to this page that shows you options for CPIC communication. Um, click on the sign up link where it's um, under I want to get announcements. This is a link. Uh, this is a sign up email that e that functions even if you are not a CPIC member. So sign up, you'll get email notifications whenever there are new guidelines that are published, whenever there's CPIC news, or whenever CPIC wants some feedback. You don't get a lot of these emails, so don't think that you're going to be spammed. Um, it is only tailored to whenever there is something that is important to announce through the CPIC website, uh, through, uh, through CPIC. Another place to get that information from is going to PharmGKB. So you, um, if you were on the uh, earlier uh, MedGened talks and NHGRI talks from this morning, you would have heard Dr. Cardo and um, Dr. Will Carrillo talk about CPIC and PharmGKB. Um, if you go to the PharmGKB website, again, bottom right of your screen here, um, L scrolling all the way down to the bottom of the website, there is a um, there is a link that there is a button that said get latest news by email, and you'll receive the latest PharmGKB blog news. And again, you don't get tons of them. You won't get spammed. It is just when there's information that is important to circulate out to the membership and the people who have signed up to email. So this is usually how the majority of us in the community know about an update in phenotype changes or updates to guidelines or new CPA guidelines that are published. So key takeaways for update of pharmacogenomic test results. Um, keep in mind that over time, as information matures in the medical literature, there is a possibility that allele functionality and phenotype assignments of certain pharmacogenes may be up, may change. Um, considerations should be in place for when to update results, how to update results and interpretation of these results, as well as how to discuss them with prescriber and patients and how to notify patients about them. And finally, CPIC and PharmGKB communication emails are a tool to learn about these pharmacogenomic updates. So, Last story we're going to talk about is um, lesson learned from adapting to a new EHR. So at St. Jude, we started returning uh, preemptive pharmacogenomic tests on an institution-wide basis back in 2011. As I mentioned earlier, we genotyped, we released two genes into the medical records uh, when we started, TPMT and CYP2D6. Um, so, and then and then quickly added, um, eventually added other genes. Um, by the time we migrated to a new EHR in October of 2022, uh, we had 14 genes that were already fully implemented um, into the medical record system. And then we were told in October 2022 that this whole thing is changing. We were going to switch to another EHR, add these 14 genes that we had already implemented. We were implementing a new one at the same time at the EHR switch. And then there was this shift to the new EHR. So what was asked for us, and it took about 18 months, uh, was really recreating a 10 years um, period worth of implementation in, from one electronic health record into another one. Uh, we created about 200, close to 300 post-test alert rules that had to be recreated in a new medical record system. About 30 pre-test alert rules were recreated, and then, um, and then other in-basket notifications had to be created, and this was something new for us. Um, something that we quickly learned is that the logic to create post to, cre to create notifications and um, interruptive alerts in the medical record system, although the logic is the same, there are specific things that are different between one EHR and another. Uh, we learned that we could not combine, combine multiple drugs into a single rule, meaning that if we were going to write um, a logic saying if a patient is an ultra-rapid metabolizer of CYP2C19, for example, um, there are recommendations to adjust the dose of uh, voriconazole and proton pump inhibitors, but the alert could not be written so that um, so that each PPI and voriconazole 
uh, were embedded in one alert and we had to create new ones, which is something that was, we had to create individual ones, which was something that was different for us. Um, the other thing that we had to switch from was um, transitioning from, from problem list into genomic indicators. Um, so we previously had used only problem list to return pharmacogen to, um, to post and display high risk pharmacogenomic test results in the medical record. Uh, we now display all the, uh, we now display all uh, pharmacogenomic phenotypes in the genomic indicator section. And so this was a switch for us because we used to only return high risk pharmacogenomic results in the problem list, whereas the genomic indicator we would also return normal metabolizer phenotypes to normal risk phenotypes. And so we thought that the great place for you to, for any clinician, so one-stop shop to see the phenotype of every patient, um, did that on every patient. And then on probably week one of implementing a new medical record system, we had a patient who had a um, G6PD activity test uh, that was returned as deficient. So um, previously, in our old medical record system, we would have returned uh, we would have placed a G6PD deficient problem list in the medical records. Um, in this case, because we moved from problem list to genomic indicators, we put we uh, we added on this patient a G6PD deficient um, genomic indicator. And then, as we did this, because the patient had a deficient activity test and not a deficient genotype test, uh, we quickly noticed that the things that we had put in place um, did not really. Um, did not really work for patients who were deficient by activity testing because our genomic indicator section, as it indicates, um, is, a genome, is um, an indicator for genomic testing, and all the information that we have related to our uh, genomic indicator relates to um, patient education and prescriber education about uh, genotype testing, including a statement in the result in um, the notifications that we send patients and where we tell them uh, you have you have been um, the test was performed to look at variations in certain gene and G6PD was one of these genes um, which made this note incorrect in our patients. So what we did notice is that we needed a problemless entry um, for G6PD deficiency and not a genomic a scenario where there would not be a genomic indicator um, need in patients who are found to be G6PD deficient without um, having been tested for G6PD um, by genotype testing. So we did that, and then noticed, um, and then noticed that um, when we created this, we also had to have our um, decision support alerts fire differently. Uh, we wanted a patient who was G6PD deficient to have an alert notifying them that they should not receive high-risk medications if, um, that are related to G6PD. However, um, our current CDS alerts um, do fire off of genomic indicators, so we had to modify the logic for our decision support alerts in patients who are um, G6PD deficient to also look for a problemless entry because you could be um, G6PD deficient either by testing of your G6PD genotype, but also more commonly by G6PD activity testing. And the same scenario applied um, to malignant hyperthermia, where a patient could have <coughs> been susceptible to developing malignant hyperthermia, either because they had a strong family history of that, or they had a personal history of being exposed to a um, triggering agent um, and developed malignant hyperthermia, or maybe just because they were susceptible to developing malignant hyperthermia because they had been genotyped for pharmacogenomics and um, but had not had the um, MH episode themselves, but still we needed to notify clinicians about it. The same also scenario applies to TPMT, where there are institutions that perform TPMT genotyping and others perform TPMT activity testing. If you do perform TPMT activity testing, it is um, this activity test is a surrogate of whether the patient has a mutation or a variation in their TPMT gene. But again, it is not a genotype test result, and you have to accommodate for that when you are working on different uh, on different scenarios for notification and for return of results for patients. So key takeaways uh, for this adapting um, to new EHR section is really to look at, um, to consider CDS alerts uh, when, so logics for CDS alerts are pretty similar, but 
um, you have to, uh, early on, when you are thinking about changing electronic medical systems, to work with your informatics team, to work with your CDS experts, uh, to be able to, um, for them to, uh, to work closely with you to explain the capabilities, limitations, and enhancements of the new system that you're going to work on, and also um, consider how to display results um, that have pharmacogenomic implications but are not obtained for pharmacogenomic testing. And in this case, it would be, in our case, it was G6PD malignant hypothermia um, as well as TPMT activity. So um, I this is this concludes the ends of my talk. Um, I wanted to just quickly men just mention a couple of things. I am one person sitting um, sitting in front of you guys talking about this, but this is a group effort. There are many people who contribute to the pharmacogenomics program at St. Jude's. Um, some of them are mentioned here, um, but it is definitely a team effort that everybody works together. And so. From my end, this concludes my session, but I just want to quickly thank you for attending and being part of NHGRI's genomic edu Healthcare Genomic Education Week. Um, there are many more education uh, sessions throughout this week. There are, uh, today's only Tuesday, so Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday also have specific topics. Um, uh, if, you go to the, if you go to the NHGRI website, you will be able to, um, to see that information. If you check on the chat, um, Donna has place the link to the NHGRI uh, recordings that are available, uh, one of which um, next week, uh, tomorrow is um, Nursing uh, Genomic Education Day. And so there is an FAQ about, uh, there's a um, recording and presentation about what nurses should know about genomic testing as well as on Friday related to rare diseases and rare genomic diseases. So. Um, with that, I will conclude and check to see if you guys have any questions. And um, thank you very much for listening in. So, um, question. Um, the first question that came up is, um, um, that is, uh, thanks for this great talk. Um, approximately how many patient family members require confirmatory testing at St. Jude per year, and what is the institutional budget for this? Um, I would say that about, um, we probably have one patient a year, um, or one patient maybe every other year, who has to have confirmatory testing for this, um, for mostly RYR1 and CACNA1S, uh, G6PD activity, uh, G6PD testing for confirmatory tests, uh, because G6PD testing is a common test at, um, that can be easily performed at many institutions. Um, we do not perform G6PD activity confirmatory testing and tell patients to go see their prescriber for that. Uh, for RYR1 and CACNA1S, it's about $1,000 per test, uh, for both tests, for RYR1 and CACNA1S. So about 1,000, no more than two per year or per every other year. Any other? Um, questions. Oh, what EHR system? Um, we are currently in the EPIC um, EHR system. We were per, we were previously in the um, in the Cerner Medical Record System. So this has taught us um, to be able to talk about both medical record systems and um, have a great collaboration with both of them. Actually. So. Um, while we're waiting or to see if there are other questions, um, a couple of things that we have learned over the years um, is that um, the return of G6PD results, the return of um, results related that, that may have familial and incidental findings um, is something that patients ask uh, questions about. Um, the advantage of pharmacogenomic testing, unlike Mendelio genetic testing, is that um, patients are genotyped for pharmacogenes, meaning that we will we explain to them that pharmacogenomics is a test that really will only tell us how their body is able to handle medications, rather than this test will this test may tell us if they have. Um, if they're predisposed to developing a certain malignancy or Huntington's in the future. So we've had pretty good acceptance rates um, for uh, parents to want to genotype their children because we're a pediatric institution. 
and um, and so there's advantages to performing pharmacogenomic testing that is targeted rather than disease genomics because it is just related to medications, and this is something that has helped us. Um, another question is, is your CDS and response information in all EPIC systems nationally? Are you sharing content? Um, so we, at the time that we went live with EPIC, um, we, uh, a couple of a couple of institutions that were already implementing pharmacogenomics in the EPIC EHR system um, have um, gotten together along with EPIC, and we created um, and uh, under the oversight of EPIC created a pharmacogenomics brain trust that comprises groups of institutions who have implemented pharmacogenomics within the EPIC EHR system, and we are working with EPIC to um, Make to to um, to work on their pharmacogenomic package and to make it available in the foundation system for Epic so that it's av available nationally and internationally. Um, content yes is being shared by us, being shared by others, and Epic has a lot of this content at this time. If it is not yet in foundation system, it will be. It's just it depends on what information you're looking for and whether it has already been rolled out into the EPIC um, foundation system with EPIC's quarterly updates. So I think we're going to end with that. Um, if you have any questions, my email information is available on the slide. Uh, is available. Um, you can always email me. I've already um, I posted it on this um, earlier at the end of this presentation. I'm always happy to help. And thank you very much for NIH and the NHGRI for hosting this session. Um, it's always interesting and really nice um, sharing information and um, comparing information with all other healthcare practitioners. Thank you, and have a good day, everyone.